From Western Kentucky to Central Ghana, farmers are rethinking how food is grown. We're talking hundreds of different types of materials that all work together. Now, everybody is getting to realize that it's not just about me, it's about the whole community. But can so-called conservation agriculture techniques win over the rapidly mechanizing farmers of the developing world? They don't just believe it's the right thing to do, they believe it's also the smart thing to do. And when you put those two things together, you know, and you start doing the right thing and the smart thing and you put those together, you know, that's a pretty powerful combination. In the early 1920s, mechanized agriculture allowed U.S. farmers to put huge new areas into production. 25 acres a day of broad, level prairie land plowed up, a fertile seed bed for the wheat. But by the 1930s, extensive overtilling had created one of the worst environmental disasters the world had seen. The wind damage being done here cannot be repaired, for the topsoil being blown from these fields cannot be replaced. The land began to give out. The dust bowl occurred, the winds began, and the agriculture ceased to produce that surplus that was needed by the cities. It was a tragic period of time when farmers lost their land, and the land also lost its productivity. Soil is the farmer's most important asset. That's his future inventory. We have lost over half the organic matter in the Great Plains because of tillage. For many observers, the Dust Bowl was only the first of a series of ecological problems that had been the result of the drive to feed the planet's ever-expanding population. When you look at population growth, just over the past few hundred years, we've had an exponential increase in the number of people on this planet, and that's really been driven by our ability to produce more food and distribute it effectively and efficiently. I think in doing that, though, we've seen a cost to our soil and our soil quality, uh, and with a focus on making sure we can feed as many mouths as possible, we've lost sight of uh, really focusing on the long-term sustainability uh, of our fields and of our agricultural practices. Many feel that a solution to this quandary may be found in a series of methods that together have come to be known as conservation agriculture. A key part of this approach is no-till farming, a technique that had some of its earliest adopters here in the rolling hills of Western Kentucky. It's a story that has its origins back in 1962 on a family farm in the town of Herndon and a research station in Southern Illinois. My dad, uh, just as a background, was the fourth generation on this family farm. My uh, great great-grandfather established it back in the 1830s. When my dad came back from his job as a farm management specialist at the University of Kentucky, he and a group of farmers went together to an experiment station in Dixon Springs, Illinois. What they saw intrigued them, a way to plant new crops through existing crop residue. Harry Young designed one of the world's first no-till planters by replicating what he saw out of discarded farm materials. He took a pile of junk and he put it on a small tractor and made a small planter for the very first no-till field in the country and possibly in the world. Today, the Youngs use the latest generation no-till planter. It allows the family to plant 16 rows at once, but follows the core idea their grandfather used in the 1960s to cut through existing crop residue and plant seeds without disturbing the topsoil. The area is rolling enough that there would be severe erosion if you tilled up many of the hills. No tillage, on the other hand, allowed us to plant crops and grow crops uh, without that erosion. The technique raised more than a few eyebrows at the time, but was ultimately embraced by agricultural scientists like Dr. Lloyd Murdoch of the University of Kentucky. The first time I ever did it, I thought, this is, this don't work, this is that's just not right, because I'm used to being tilled. We had lost 
about eight inches of topsoil over the last 50 years before we started no-tilling here in Kentucky, and they had lost even more than that in some areas. And so they were really anxious to make something happen because they could see that it wasn't a sustainable situation and system that they were using. Today, at the Princeton Research Station, Dr. Murdoch's team holds open to the public field days, showing visiting farmers how the technique allows for crop residues to enrich the soil and conserve ground moisture. Conventional tilling exposes the earth to the atmosphere, leading to the loss of topsoil through erosion and the release of CO2. In contrast, with no-till techniques, the root systems of previous crops are preserved, leading to healthier soil ecosystems. The key to healthy soils is therefore in the ground, soil organic matter, the whole food web um, of microorganisms and soil fauna that work together. There's a lot more going on under the soil than above the soil. You run a disc across the field and it looks all fluffed up on top, but underneath, you just killed a whole bunch of worms. You just destroyed the network for water to percolate down. Government incentives and outreach programs across the U.S., including those in Kentucky, have helped expand no-till to almost 25% of U.S. farmlands. For many U.S. farmers, the technique has preserved topsoil and brought significant cost savings. For many scientists, a new key battleground is the developing world, where huge amounts of forests are being converted to farmland. The key question is on what model will it mechanize? Conventional plowing or no-till? Here, in the West African country of Ghana, a booming economy and a growing middle class demand more and better food offerings. The economy has been opened up since the 1980s. We have a, a booming and expanding middle class who are well informed and have uh, their choice as to what it is that they want to eat. At the Ghanaian Ministry of Agriculture, Government experts are partnering with groups such as the Howard G. Buffett Foundation and Texas A&M University to study ways to expand and improve Ghana's food production. Together, they are undertaking a wide-ranging survey of Ghanaian agricultural zones. No-till farming may be part of their solution. It's very important when looking at the adoption of modern technologies that you have a very good awareness of the uh, different uh, soil characteristics, the different weather patterns of different regions. Here in central Ghana, Bertha Esa is the manager of a successful cacao farm that has raised production by using new techniques and partnering with government outreach programs. They must adopt the appropriate technology adopt the appropriate tools uh, for uh, working the soil and adopt uh, tools that will keep the soil productivity high. And the only way to do so is to have uh, no-till and other associate technologies that will keep uh, the environment for production uh, uh, intact. But the Ghanaian government faces significant challenges to increasing agriculture production. In many areas of Ghana, rainforests are being converted to farmland at a high rate. Much of it is happening through the process known as slash and burn, which, like conventional plowing, releases large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. While slash and burn clears land to grow more food, it is a short-term solution, and soil fertility is exhausted after only one or two years of farming. Dr. Kofi Boa started training farmers to adopt no-till agriculture in 2002, in part in response to these threats. Recognizing that his country was on the verge of mechanizing its agriculture on a large scale, Boa is hopeful that local farmers will adopt the no-till model. At the Center for No-Till Agriculture, what we stress on is uh, the soil counts first. We always get a farmer to appreciate 
that you need to take care of the soil and the soil will take care of the plants. In 2008, the Howard G. Buffett Foundation made the first of what would ultimately be a $3 million investment in Kofi Boa's work, allowing Kofi to expand his outreach efforts and create the Howard G. Buffett Center for No-Till Agriculture and provide design input to no-till tools made specifically for the Ghanaian market. We see that in our efforts to alleviate global hunger uh, and bring people out of poverty, uh, we can't do it with short-term fixes. We can't do it with just adding some seed and fertilizer and chemicals uh, for a single season. We have to be doing it in a way that will stand the test of time and that will treat our ecological systems with a method of sustainability that, uh, that really they require. A key element of this demonstration is to show that no-till can be a part of a modern and mechanized approach to agriculture. This is our mechanized center, and that is, this is a place where we teach people mechanized conservation agriculture to get people to appreciate the fact that we use machines, especially when you need to scale up. An essential piece of equipment is the roller crimper, a device especially designed to help mechanized no-till succeed in developing countries such as Ghana. One thing that's unique uh, to this program is uh, a specific piece of machinery. It's called a roller crimper. Um, and you can kind of think of it like a, a lawnmower, but uh, one that doesn't cut the grass, it just folds it over. And it has a whole lot of benefits for conservation agriculture, especially in the developing world where you need to leave um, a cover that, that slowly biodegrades. The very moment we crimp, then we come to plant. You see, as the vegetation is browning, then the green thing starts coming out. For many young farmers, seeing no-till happen with mechanized equipment is an important and potentially life-changing experience. In this country, if anybody talks about mechanization, it's the just equated to plowing. The very moment we started showing people the way to go as far as mechanized CA is concerned, people have become so much interested. We hope that through this more technical approach, this more scientific approach, that these young farmers will see that there's hope in their moving back to the farms and finding a life for themselves there. Dr. Boa and his team also visit remote villages, bringing generators and electrical equipment to show farmers across the country the difference that no-till can make. <laughs> Looking in the faces of people that come here and watching them go back and the commitment and more especially the feedback that I get from people, I get so motivated. And I say that I will surely see Ghana becoming a noted country, furthering through West Africa and Africa before I die. Back in Accra, the West African headquarters of John Deere is rolling out its new 1025 no-till planter. It is one part of a larger conservation agriculture partnership and is specifically designed for the Ghanaian market. The planter was developed in an unusual collaboration between the Howard G. Buffett Foundation and John Deere tractors. I got a surprise uh, invitation to go meet with the president of John Deere, and I sat down with him and he says, look, we need to understand Africa. I said, you're looking at, a, at millions of smallholder farmers. And I said, I'll tell you something I want to do. I want to understand, can John Deere build a planter for those farmers? They actually agreed to go to work on that idea, which I was shocked. We have this conservation equipment that we developed together, and they have product they can sell. People will see their product and use their product, but they'll also get the experience that we want to give them of how they can farm in a conservation-based manner. Here, in Ghana's north, lies the frontier where the future of Ghana's agriculture will be decided. It is a region of open plains suitable for large-scale mechanized farming. Its population is largely Muslim and is grappling with the issue of what model to use, traditional till farming or new mechanized no-till. 
Northern Ghana is an area of promise. It has ample water resources. There are expanses of land that are underutilized at this time or lower levels of productivity. So there's ample opportunity to bring about higher prosperity. Dr. Boa and his team work with local extension agents to support Northern farmers considering adopting the no-till model. While a local farm here has been using mechanized plowing for only a few years, the depletion of topsoil is already evident. The tractor plowing basically is faster, but uh, it's not very good for the soil. Farmers here complain a lot about the soil, the depletion of the soil, and it's due to annual cropping. Every year, that's the only place they crop, every year. As the world grapples with the question of how to feed its people while also preserving the planet, the need for new approaches to agriculture becomes clear. For many, the key will be to show more and more farmers that combining new technology with age-old practices is not only possible, but necessary. One thing that's so interesting about conservation agriculture is in a lot of ways it's returning to the way a natural ecosystem would have been operating in the first place. And so that could be making sure you have some sort of crop that's growing, uh, a cover crop all year round, uh, making sure that you're uh, maintaining nutrients in the soil, doing the kinds of things that Mother Nature would do uh, just on its own. What you're doing is you're doing what you should do. You're doing what's best for the soil. You're doing what's best for water quality and, and no-tilling because it's the smartest thing I can do in terms of profitability. It's the best thing I can do for my soil. It's, it's, it's the right long-term strategy for my biggest investment, which is my farmland. When we go no tillage, we'll be reducing the negative impacts of all these practices so that all of us will live in harmony with nature. Now, everybody is getting to realize that it's not just about me, it's about the whole community. And that is part of our teaching. Farming is not a short-term enterprise. It is a multi-generational enterprise. I'm thankful that my dad took care of the land and at my turn at bat, I hope that we'll find out after the fact, my son will anyway, that we have taken care of the land as well. I feel like it's important that we leave the soil in better shape than when we found it. That's an important part of agriculture because after all, we are stewards and without that idea of stewardship, we think a little more highly of ourselves than we ought. We're just here for a time and after that, someone else will be enjoying this place when we're gone.